Back, second hour, and we are uh, continuing to uh, march our way up to the NFL draft. That is now four hours away. And uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, later with Field Yates of ESPN, Marcus Spears, and then uh, hopefully uh, from Philadelphia, Coach Ed Ogeron. Let's uh, continue with more calls, and Charles is up next. Good afternoon, Paul. Hi there. I was listening to Ed a while ago, and uh, I got a big heart, and uh, he touched my heart. And uh, I'm going to pray for Ed and all the listeners out there. They got a chance to do something special. I believe in the power of prayer, and prayer can do things when medicine and doctors can't do it. So all y'all people out there listening, call in. or just You don't have to call in. Just pray for Ed. You'd be surprised. You might get a blessing from it. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a, a nice call there. Elizabeth is in Memphis, and you are next up. Hello, Professor Feinbaum. It's such an honor and a privilege to be able to speak with you again. We last spoke, and I was able to get in a couple, three years ago, maybe. It is, but anyway, uh, it's been way too long, Elizabeth. So great, so great to, to uh, have you back. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I wanted to call and, and give you kudos and laud you for the important cultural function that you perform in our society today. I mean, look at what you've done just today, Paul. You give voice to so many people who increasingly find themselves uh, on the margins uh, for some reason, whether it's illness or or whatever. And I just think it's really awesome what you do, and in addition to talking about football and things like that. So I just, I just wanted to laud you for, you know, the important role that you play in our culture today because you're just awesome. Uh, because I'm an English professor, I also wanted to compliment you on the fact that when you say, how are you doing, because of you, I think you have single-handedly changed this dynamic in America today. People no longer say good. They say well because it's Paul <laughs> Feinbaum. So I want to thank you for that. Well, you, you know, uh, by the way, uh, it took me being corrected on that many, many years ago <laughs> to understand my own uh, – uh, poor English uh, training, so uh, but it, it is, uh, and I, I never try to. I mean, I, I, I when you do this, uh, I don't hear the things that you do, but uh, that is one of the most common mistakes. There, there's, there are a few other ones out there that I'll leave for the imagination. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the reasons that I called because uh, today seems to be like a health-oriented sort of theme. I was curious to know what has happened to the young man Robert, who lived, I think, in the northern part of the country that he used to, he used to call a lot. Yeah, Robert. Uh, Robert is in. Uh, if it's the same one you're thinking of, is from Iowa. Iowa, that's it. And yeah, you know, I'm. It's a really good question uh, because Robert has not. Uh, we have not heard from him in a couple of weeks. I know we've heard from him this year, but Robert, uh, for those who don't know, uh, is from Waterloo. Iowa. He uh, used to call in. We became really good friends with him, and yeah. through a, uh, a a benefactor and friend of ours who happened to have a plane, he he, he flew a, a group of us to Iowa several years ago, and we spent the day, mm-hmm. and it was memorable. Yeah, I do remember you speaking about that. So, uh, second question is: um, I'm a huge Alabama fan, and one of the top five things I experienced in my life happened this weekend when uh, the University of Alabama allowed the fan base to go out on the field and so i went with my roommate uh 30 years before back when we were you know college freshmen and we used to read the birmingham news and we would uh impugn your your dignity because at that time you were not an alabama fan but that's <laughs> another subject for another day but anyway nonetheless we had the great privilege of rolling around in the end zone and it was just you know one of the top five moments okay which oh my goodness speak. yeah yeah it was did awesome. you uh did you suddenly feel 21 again I did. I actually felt like 16. Yeah. It was a very fleeting moment because then the next day, you know, I can't get out of bed because, you know, it's it, 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 it rolling around the grass at, at our advanced age. But anyway, so there's that. But then uh, during the course of the A-Day game, Nick Saban was on the field, impeccably dressed with his beautiful little uh, sports jacket. And um, it, was, it was quite warm that day. And then I noticed that he handed his sports jacket to, which I, I presume to be uh, the, uh, the new offensive coordinator. And I'm not sure if that's who that is. But anyway, in so doing, it seemed to be sort of like a rhetorical move, like you're not the boss, because Lane Kiffin apparently had, you know, anyway. I just wondered your thoughts on, yeah, on that. Yeah, well, number one, I, I have it from a very good source, uh, and I can reveal who that is, Laura Rutledge, who was on the field. 
that uh, he was sweating profusely, but he was refusing oh. to take that jacket off. Because, uh, th- yeah. And I asked him about that once. Uh, the year I coached the Alabama team, so I, I saw a good bit of him on the sidelines. I said, why are you dressed like this? And he said it was, it was, it was, it was an image that he was trying to portray and, and have disseminated uh, to the uh, recruits that he was uh, – that he was, a, I think that he was a, the head coach. He was in charge, and you should look like you're in charge. Now, I say that because he doesn't dress like that during the regular season games. Yeah, that, and that's the dichotomy that I was, you know, was hoping to help, uh, you know, get some insights from you about because it just seems sort of odd because you know if you're thinking, if you're a recruit, I can only imagine that you are interested in Alabama enough to watch the games, you know, as a high school senior or whatever when you're not able to go, and then you would see Coach Saban dressed you know, as is normally, you know, in his normal attire. But anyway, so. And, and by the way, he doesn't, uh, and I, I, I'll, I'll tell just only you this, I have been in his closet, okay? <laughs> oh, um, my God. <laughs> I, uh, like? I know this sounds like uh, I spend too much time at Saban's house, but we were there one morning doing a television show with, uh, with Miss Terry. Uh, I think Coach hung around for a while and then took off. And, and we went upstairs, and she was taking me, uh, around and, and and I was being very inquisitive about his clothes and where he got them. Yeah. Uh, and I believe she, uh, he he has them made. There's a there's a I think a New York tailor that uh, he was introduced to from uh, Wayne Heisinga, who uh, was his uh, boss at the Miami Dolphins. And he I think in particular he gets these very colorful ones. Remember the uh, the salmon colored. Uh, oh, that was beautiful. Definitely. He had that one two years ago. Uh, and and I, the reason I know that is I spent the day with him flying around the country and he had it on and I asked him about it. And, uh, and he, he, I think it's just a spring look. He's not really coaching the game. He's right. on television most of the time. Right, right, right. Um, okay, so there's that. And then my final issue is, you know, I listen to you every afternoon. And um, I just wonder if Jim from Tuscaloosa can ever call in and speak about anything in which he does not find himself at the center of the conversation. You know, I, I just feel sorry for the guy. I mean, I, I, was, I was on my way to Tuscaloosa when he had that confrontation with Millie. She's such a nice, gracious lady, and she handled him with a plum. But uh, anyway, I just, I just wanted to make that comment. Well, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll try. I've already been a, I've already been a minister today. I'll try not to be a, a psychiatrist. Um, <laughs> but most important, I, I am thrilled you have called because uh, I, it has forced me to think about my words before I spit them out. Oh, you do you do an impeccable job. I mean, really, you, uh, your words are analogous to Nick Saban's wardrobe. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's All a, right, roll tide. Thanks, Paul. Great to hear from you. Uh, I, I, a long time ago, uh, early in my writing career, I uh, received a uh, missive from a, an English teacher. She was not as uh, kind as our friend, the professor. And she, remember back uh, in, some of you probably don't remember because you, 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 you went to school using a computer, but back in the day, you, you literally wrote it out. And uh, she had marked up an article of mine, uh, uh, redlining it, uh, subject predicate, infinitive adverb. I mean, it was just, I was just horrified when it was all over. And uh, it, it makes you very self-conscious when you, uh, when you think uh, that there are English teachers out there reading your work or speaking to one. Millie would have been a good English teacher, don't you think? Uh, Millie, good afternoon. Well, good afternoon, Paul. How are you doing this day? In honor of Elizabeth, very well. Okay, yeah, I heard what she said, and she's such a gracious lady. She was she was fantastic. Yeah, anyway, uh, I came back from our prayer session, and I put Ed on our uh, prayer chain that I hope that he gets better. I hope that it was okay. Thank you, and uh, yeah, I thought it was really, really. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure Ed's been, has been able to listen. So hopefully, some friends will communicate this. But uh, he has really uh, made an impact on our our, our our audience today. Yeah, well, I didn't see your first half, uh, first hour of it because I was at the prayer meeting. Yeah, so. well, Ed had called. Uh, he's been moved to a nursing home, and that's uh, he gave us an update. Well, good because then in the nursing home he will get a lot of care, and he will get back on his feet. Pretty much, he should be able to. Hopefully. Well, the good news is, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, I know all about this too too well from friends and family. But uh, when you know, you, the good news is, getting out of the hospital, 
you still have to go to some sort of uh, nursing home, assisted living, rehab center before you are in the clear. So that's where he is now. Yeah, and the one thing I would like to ask you, Paul, that is driving me crazy, it seems like that uh, this thing that's going to be on tonight, this uh, whatever it's called, it's almost like uh, it's uh, the draft or, you know, getting the... It's called the NFL draft, uh, Millie. Yeah, anyway, the thing of it is it seems more like a cattle call more than anything else. It just doesn't seem like... uh, it just doesn't seem quite right sometimes, you know. It just well, seems let, me, like- let me try to explain it to you very quickly. Um, the the NFL Combine uh, in Indianapolis is a cattle call. This is a cash call because if you are the first play, if you are the first player chosen, what, what's what's an NFL? What's the first player n- normally get, guys? Uh, Twenty million dollar bonus or? Yeah, yeah I mean, it you, just seems. Uh, I mean, you're talking about uh, an enormous amount of money, and yeah. it is the moment of a lifetime. So it's, uh, it's the culmination of every uh, young man's dreams who plays football. Yeah, but it just seems like then it's just uh, uh, they don't play. For, I guess you were right a long time ago when you told me that it was uh, it was more of a for money. It wasn't for the sport itself anymore. Not like uh, when really, you're in. Uh, let me let me make it clear to you. I mean, this is professional football tonight, uh, and yeah. the object of professional football is to get paid. It's a business. Well, I know it's a business, but it sometimes it just seems like it's too much of a business. Yeah, you know. Well, it, it may be, but uh, if you're the uh, CEO at uh, Apple or Sears or any other company in America, your what do you, you, your goal is to make money and please your stockholders. Yeah, and another thing I wanted to mention too. Really, uh, by the way, I, I know this may come as a surprise to you, but what we do here, this yep. is actually a business. Well, I know, but... Not much uh, of one sometimes, but it is a business. But the thing of it is, you all are, uh, you're knowledgeable, you teach us things. You know, yeah, you're well, like we're a in the, well, we're, 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 we're in the education business. Yeah, you and uh, John and Mark and Laura, you guys teach me so much every day, you know, that I watch you, and I watch you guys as faithful as I can. I know you do. And so the thing of it is, is that uh, someone better clue uh, Nick Saban into uh, if he gets hot, he should take his jacket off because he could fall on the uh, right there on the field, and yeah, that he, wouldn't be such a good idea. Well, the good news is uh, there are physicians on standby and trainers. Uh, thanks for the call, Millie. Some business tonight. Man, we should all be so lucky to be the first player taken in the NFL draft and cash a check tomorrow for 10 or 15 or 20 million dollars that's 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 tough we will take a break more calls more guests on draft day after this back from uh, radio we appreciate uh, been a really interesting call uh, a lot of callers today wishing ed well very poignant and uh, we appreciate uh, this audience i uh, I say it over and over again. There is no uh, better. There may be better talk show hosts. There may be better shows overall. There, 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 there are no better people, no better, no better callers than we have here on the Fine Bomb Show. Thanks again. Let's uh, check in with Tim in Florida. Hello, Tim. Good afternoon. Hello, Paul Fine Bomb. How's it going, buddy? Very well. Thank you. Wonderful. I, I just want to add to everyone's best wishes for Ed and uh, telling to keep on trucking and things are going to get better. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure he hears that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I wanted to first tell you, you were just talking about you may not be the best talk show host. I think you are. Well, thank you. Um, uh, you know, Tim, I, I, unlike some shows, and I, I know it's always, it's always, it's always uh, interesting for the host of a show to critique his own show, but, I mean, if you, if you go down the dial, uh, usually a program is about the host. And I realize my name is everywhere. Fine. I get it. Um, but I don't think there is a show like this one anywhere where the callers really do make the program tick. And, and I say that because uh, it's true and it has been proven time and time again. And let's go back. If, if you eliminate the callers, there's only so much I could do after uh, a situation like we had with Ed, but the callers make it real. 
And when you hear one after another talk about, uh, in Millie's case, her prayer group and other people's case, what they've, what they've been through, that's really what brings it home. And, um, Paul, if, if I could, uh, I would like to talk about Shane from Centerpoint. Sure. A little bit. Um, I grew up with Shane. Uh, right before I started first grade, we moved there on the corner house right next to theirs on Shirley Drive. And we were together all through elementary school, junior high, and high school. And he he was my protector, sort of. I I've been legally blind from birth, and I had a double uh, aneurysm rupture in my head and uh, in my brain in '76, uh, mm. and had a lot of rehab, but. Um, Shane was always there for me, and and he, he <laughs> I felt like he was he was my protector. But I know stuff about Shane that nobody else knows. When we were growing up, first off, his voice was always deep. When even in first grade, his voice was deep, and he always had curly hair, and he was always the tallest in the class. But um, I wanted to tell you this one is episode where. Uh, we were over visiting their house. We had moved uh, uh, further away, and uh, Shane and I were standing by the back of our car, and um, we asked Lance to, we got the key from my mother, and we asked Lance to open the trunk, and I didn't know what we were doing, and Shane said, come on, Tim, let's get in, and it took a little convincing, but we got in, and Lance closed the trunk, and I'm like, can't second tell her that trunk door was closed. I never got a worse beating in my life, and he was hollering, screaming. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's just a little glimpse into uh, Shane when he was a kid. No, and, and as you know, and I'll tell you, uh, Tim, uh, for those who don't uh, know the story, and I realize a lot of you don't, Shane passed away. I believe in uh, December of 2011, and uh, he was a regular caller every every day, four o'clock. He was the opening uh, caller, and he uh, he just became uh, one of the great characters in the show's history. And when he died, uh, you you may remember this, Tim. He died late. Thursday night or early Friday morning of SEC championship weekend. The game was uh, LSU in Georgia. In fact, Alabama was, uh, this was the year Alabama won the national championship for some context. And I went, uh, heard about it very early uh, Friday morning. And we knew uh, it was close. Um, We did the show on Friday from the Georgia Dome. It's the weekend of the SEC championship. It's the weekend of the college uh, at the time. It was the BCS. So Alabama was waiting to see what happened that weekend and they had, uh, to see whether they would end up playing LSU in a rematch. And, and I would say to you, the entire show on Friday, I believe, was about Shane. Uh, we, we, had get, we had guests set up from all over the place, and we just scrubbed the whole thing, even though we were in Atlanta. Uh, people and and the the other part of that is that you know this Shane used to joke that he was my brother-in-law. Yes, yes. And, when, and when I every everywhere I everywhere I went in the Georgia Dome, I had people coming up and literally hugging me, saying, you know, "We're so sorry <laughs> for your loss." And he, I mean, I felt like he was. And I gave the eulogy that uh, Sunday, Tim. I don't know if you knew this or not. I knew it. And. I, I, it was very difficult to do. Uh, we were outside. It was, the wind was howling. It was it was a, it was an unusually uh, windy day, and and I said uh, I, I'll try to remember exactly. I don't know if I can remember exactly, but I said I hate I hate I feel like I must finally confess uh, in front of all of you here that I'm really not Shane. I mean, it was obviously a joke. I'm really not Shane's <laughs> brother-in-law, uh, but I think I, I think but I ended it by saying but I loved him. Uh, just as much as I would had he had he been, and it was uh, it was just a a, a a weekend that I'll never forget. And um, you you should never forget. And also, I just want to say you're the perfect host for this show because if it had another host, it would be a completely different show. Well, you let the callers 
juice, what they want to talk about, and uh, I mean, you have guests on and everything, and we get on topics. But um, I, I just want to let I, I want to get off in a hurry because I know people are waiting. But um, I just want to say thank you, Paul, for all you've done for us, and uh, just uh, keep it going, buddy. And I promise this won't be the last call I make to you. I hope not. Tim, uh, be well and uh, stay in touch, my friend. I will, buddy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We'll uh, head out of here in a moment and uh, begin digging in a little bit more seriously on tonight's NFL draft. What is exactly is going to happen? Is Garrett going to be the first player taken, or will the Cleveland Browns go with Mitchell Trubisky? We'll find out with an expert when we come back. Welcome back. Uh, We are glad uh, to have all of you here, and uh, what an interesting day it has been. Uh, Most of us woke up this morning listening to the experts say that Mitchell Trubisky of North Carolina was going to be the number one pick of the Browns. That's what all the sources were saying, and here it is, 4.33 in the afternoon. It seems like the sources have gotten a reality check. Now multiple sources are telling people that it will be Cleveland for Miles Garrett. We uh, bring in Field Yates from ESPN. Good to talk to you again, Field. Enjoyed meeting you a few weeks ago. And uh, you've been watching this all day long like everyone else. Uh, so uh, at this hour, is it safe to assume now, he's, now, now it's going to be uh, Miles Garrett in Cleveland? Yeah, Paul, I think the hay is largely in the barn at this point, And Miles Garrett can start to decide what jersey number he needs to wear for the Cleveland Browns. Obviously, he has been viewed as the number one player in this year's draft for several months. The question is simply this. Is there more value if a Mitch Trubisky becomes an elite franchise quarterback versus if Miles Garrett becomes a game-changing pass rusher? It appears as though the Browns are hedging on the possibility of Garrett becoming a superstar as much more likely than any of these quarterbacks becoming an Andrew Luck-type franchise-changing player. Phil, tell me this because... We've known for how long that Cleveland was going to have the first pick, uh, probably since they first started playing football at the beginning of time. But we, we knew it, we knew it months ago. How do we get to the morning of the draft and they've changed their mind and now they have changed their mind again? Who's running this operation? Well, I think that an NFL organization that's running on all cylinders is one that specifically has a head coach and a general manager working in concert and that have a shared vision as to how to build their football team. I think what we've seen in Cleveland is even if they end up taking Miles Garrett and he becomes a superstar, is that perhaps not both sides of the operation are entirely on the same page as it comes to valuing players specifically in this instant instance, Miles Garrett versus Mitch Trubisky. Uh, Obviously, there has been no organization that has thought outside the box more in terms of assembling a front office than the Cleveland Browns. They hired a former baseball executive and Paul D. Podesta to basically run the personnel dealings, and it feels as though maybe the, the coaching staff might have sort of a more traditional approach to evaluating players, whereas the front office is still thinking outside the box in a way the coaching staff isn't accustomed to. That might account for why we are seeing, or at least a perceived flip-flop between Garrett and Trubisky, whether it's just something that specifically took place this morning or something that they've been waffling on for a handful of weeks or months now. Let's move on because uh, we, we at least assume for now that he will be, in, not that there haven't been last-minute dramatics at the NFL draft. Uh, hello, Laramie Tunsil. But what, uh, after him, what's your best guess on the next four or five picks? Yes, yeah, so we can go right through the order here. If I had to guess, I think San Francisco goes with Solomon Thomas, the Stanford defensive lineman who had really one of his best games in, that, in their final game against North Carolina, not a great offensive line, but a dominant performance from the early entrant out of Stanford. And then the third pick would be the Chicago Bears, where I think at that point you might see Jamal Adams, an SEC player, of course, very familiar. The LSU safety who sort of set the tone in some ways for that defense that can do the same for Chicago Bears defense. It needs all sorts of help. And then things get interesting at pick four 
with the Jacksonville Jaguars. I do believe that Leonard Fournette is squarely in the mix right there, a running back who's built almost like a linebacker or a tight end in terms of stature, and they need someone who can take some pressure off of Blake Bortles. But I'm not going to be shocked if a quarterback is the pick for Jacksonville at pick four. Blake Bortles has been, to put it kindly, up and down so far in the first three seasons of his NFL career. And then at pick five, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the point where we have our first trade of the night. If the Browns do, in fact, go with Miles Garrett at pick one, which we are assuming they will right now, maybe they intend to trade back up to that fifth pick. At that point, they could take Mitch Trubisky and wind up with the best of both worlds, a quarterback plus the best player in the draft. I mean, there were there, again draft boards change like like uh, like the weather. But uh, there were there were draft boards a few months ago that had Jonathan Allen as high as two. Some believed maybe he was the best player in the draft. Uh, where do you see him going now? Not far after that five pick, the fifth pick that I mentioned, and maybe even in the top five picks, he is a player who perhaps, if you look at what he did last season, was as impressive on the field as any defensive player. There's really only one hesitation with Jonathan Allen, and that's the fact that he's got shoulders that, you know, they're not what you see out of a player in his young 20s. He's got shoulders that teams are concerned about, the possibility they don't have uh, the tread in them to last 10 or 12 years in the NFL. Uh, We just don't know how specifically each team has evaluated Jonathan Allen's medical situation, but that's really the only hang-up on him. You know, I've really taken note of what Nick Saban's had to say about Jonathan Allen, and, you know, he didn't miss any games or didn't miss any practices, was certainly a a competitor for his entire tenure at Alabama, and I'd imagine that uh, they felt pretty good about his production. I just think NFL teams are worried that not that his best football is behind him, but that the shelf life for Jonathan Allen might be a little bit shorter than someone like a Solomon Thomas who plays a similar type of game. Field, certainly uh, there have been uh, some strange stories, but one of the strangest has been Reuben Foster. He made the rounds the other day. As you know, he answered all the questions well, but has he answered those questions to the satisfaction of NFL GMs? I think he has. I just think that that might account for a drop in his draft status. He might have been, you know, if he just evaluated a player's ability on the field, he might have, might be one of the top six or eight prospects in this year's class. But now you're talking about a player who had a bizarre incident at the Combine involving one of the medical professionals, a confrontation there. You couple that with the diluted sample, and teams may say, you know something, we have to account for a couple of these things that, you know, when we're picking in the top 10 or 12 or 18 picks, We don't want to have to deal with a player who we have some question marks surrounding, especially this close to the draft. So perhaps Foster finds himself being picked in the 20s as opposed to the teens or even in the top 10, something that at one point during the draft process would have felt like the heist of the century if he made it to the later part of the first round. But that may end up being his fate because of some unique twists and turns he's taken since that time. It seems to me, having watched him play, that Derek Barnett ought to be talked about more, but he's not. What is your assessment of the Tennessee star? He was a star, and you're absolutely right. If you just watch what he did on the field, you're thinking to yourself, how could this guy not be one of the players discussed as a top six, seven, eight, maybe even ten prospect? You know, the interesting part for him is... The measurables didn't blow you away during the pre-draft process, but I, I, mean, I had a long conversation with one of my most trusted scouts in the NFL last night who talked about him, and you, know, you go to Tennessee, and that program speaks of him as the guy. He was the guy at Tennessee for his time there and was a dominant player. Uh, every time I had the chance to see him in college and then subsequently watching him since that time, he was very productive on the field. You know, didn't have remarkable testing scores physically compared to some of these other top-rated defensive linemen. Uh, But I would not bet against Derek Barnett finding a way to be productive at the NFL level. It may not be as pretty and may not be as glitzy and highlight-driven as some of the other edge rushers, but he always seems to find a way to get in the ear hole of an opposing quarterback. And there's so, there's so many players out there. One we I don't think we've talked about. Sometimes you get confused. Is O.J. Howard? Uh, I've seen him pretty high on some boards. What about yours? Yeah, this is a player that it's you know you have to if if you're saying something negative about O.J. Howard, it's because you are doing an exercise in which you are tasked with finding something negative about that player. Obviously, was you know physically is very talented. He is he doesn't just look the part. He is the part of a tight end. He's got this massive frame. 
gifted athletically, tested very well during the combine, healthy player. The only knock against him is really that his production was sort of pedestrian, but as everybody knows, that was not his own doing. That was the offense that he played in and just the way that he was utilized at Alabama. But much like Deshaun Watson, O.J. Howard played his best in the biggest games. Obviously had two great national championship game appearances. Would not surprise me if he goes in the top ten picks. Maybe the only thing that prevents that is the fact that teams don't necessarily view tight end as a position that has as much value in those first 10 selections. And finally, you mentioned uh, Deshaun Watson. Uh, yeah. He has been all over the boards, but who hasn't been all over the boards? Uh, is he going to make it in the first round? I think he does, and you know, I mentioned earlier the possibility of Jacksonville sniffing around a quarterback at pick four. Perhaps that could be a landing spot for Deshaun Watson. And then the thing I always, you know, we always remember, and it's always worth cautioning people when they evaluate how the draft board's going to play out, is that quarterbacks are going to be targets in trade-ups. So who has the seventh pick right now could be a lot different than who has the seventh pick four or five hours from now. So don't be surprised if teams trade up and try to acquire a player like Deshaun Watson. I think the Arizona Cardinals at pick 13 would make some sense. Perhaps uh, the New Orleans Saints at pick 11 as well, given that they now have two first-round picks after their trade with the New England Patriots. Great stuff. Uh, Field Yates joining us. Uh, thank you very much. Long Thanks, night Paul. ahead. We, we look forward to talking to you soon. Really interesting, fascinating conversation there with Field, telling us that Miles Garrett is going to be the first player taken. We could have just excised all the uh, interviews and uh, debates that we've seen s from six o'clock this morning until now, because they've all been m they've all been rendered moot now by uh, the latest reports. We will take a break. Come back to discuss this and more of your phone calls. Marcus Spears knows Miles Garrett very well. We'll get his take a little bit later on. Back with us. Thanks for uh, listening and watching. Let's uh, check in next with Lisa in Ohio. Hello, Lisa. Hello? Hi there. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, me and my husband are going to be <laughs> not on the same team the first of the season. Uh, I'm a Michigan fan, and he's a Gator fan, but I'm also a Gator fan, too. Okay. How can we not fight after the game if one team wins and one okay, team couple loses? Of, let, me, let me go Dr. Phil on you here, Okay. <laughs> Please uh, do. How, how long have you been married? Uh, going on six years. Okay. Just listening to the sound of your voice, I'm sensing it's a good marriage. Oh, yes. Okay. So my, I deduct from that that a, uh, a college football game is probably not really going to upset the apple cart very much. No. Okay. It did when uh, Florida and Michigan played in the – game a few years ago okay, what, in what, the what, playoffs. What happened afterwards? Uh, I had to walk outside and laugh <laughs> because Michigan won. And how did he respond? Oh, got mad. He got mad. didn't talk to me for a week. So. Oh, okay, well, well, hey, by the way, take back everything I just got through saying we got a serious <laughs> problem here. Um, you are clearly a, a Michigan fan in this game, are you not? Oh, yeah. Okay, so... But I also like the Gators. Yeah, well, you're not going to like them on the first Saturday night of the football season. <laughs> oh, I know. We're both outcasts in our family now, because you, he's will, a will you, Gator, will you and watch I'm the, a Michigan, and we're from Ohio. You'll watch the game together, I, I, I suspect. Oh, yeah. Okay. So how should I, or how should we... I think you need oh. to – I think you here, – here's what I believe. In, that you, you always need to be prepared. A great football coach told me once, I am prepared to go into that locker room after the game, win or lose, and I'm prepared to talk to the media, win or lose. So you need to think about what's going to happen because I'm telling you right now, Lisa, it is going to happen. Michigan oh, yeah. is going uh, I, to lose to I, the Gators. I, I want Michigan to win again no, against no, Florida. Not happening. But Michigan I know is it's going not going to gonna happen. So you need to think about, are you going to be supportive of him in his moment of celebration? Oh, yeah. Well, think about something nice that you could do. Does he like cookies or cakes? or? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, why don't you uh, be be prepared? The game's going to end very late, by the way. Where, where do you you live in uh, Ohio? 
Yeah, I'm, we're both from Ohio. Okay, and that's why is, I said we're both outcasts in our family because yeah. everybody's a Buckeye fan. We yeah. don't like the Buckeyes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get that. Um, so you'll watch the game from your house? Oh, yeah. We don't, don't invite nobody over, nothing okay. like that when it comes to the games like that. Well, well I think I think you have a much or. I think you have a much easier time because oh. because I, I'm telling you right now ex- exclusively right here that you are going to be the loser. So uh, you might think about that. You you have a couple of months to be prepared. Oh yeah, I just wanted to get your input on it. So now is he a uh, bad winner? Huh? I mean, I mean, he's a, he's a Florida Gator, so winning. Yeah, he he's a Gator fan, die hard. I mean, is he, does he? Is he one that would like to rub it in after the after the game? I don't know. You want to ask him? Yeah, put him on. Hang on. Here, call Feinstein. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I just called this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with, with whom am I speaking? You're speaking to Rick. Rick, this is Paul Feinbaum. Uh, your wife called me I mean, just to talk about sports, by the way, and. I told her that you're probably going to win this game between Florida and Michigan. So are you going to be okay if it doesn't go that way? Well, (laughs) I'm looking forward to all Gators. Yeah, well, I think you're going to win. So my advice to you, she sounds like a really nice woman. Right. So I wouldn't gloat like some Gator fans have been known to do. Just win gracefully, okay? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, Gator fans are pretty. I mean, here's what I would do after the game. The second the game ends, I would do the Gator chomp right in her face (laughs) four or five times and then say, okay, let's get on with the rest of our lives. Right. It's over. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this, I know this, I know this, um... Five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer.